Hi folks, hope you're okay, it's uh, good to be with you. It's good to be with you, I'm just going to do a, a, a sermon. Um, I go to a church in the morning on uh, the south side of Manchester and um, I uh, I go, I'm going there in the morning but in the afternoon I'm also a member of a church which meets in the afternoon and uh, every month they ask me to preach and my sermon uh, today which I'm going to preach for them is in Genesis and uh, so let's just pray Father we thank you for this day we thank you for your love and grace and we just pray as we look at your word we pray that you'd minister to our hearts and Father that it be a blessing in our hearts Lord in your name and for your glory Amen the text if you want to look at the text is Genesis uh, chapter 50 and uh, verse 20 but as for you you thought evil against me but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save many people alive for as for you you thought evil against me but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save many people alive so I'm gonna just meditate on my sermon I'm just gonna check if it's if it's on Sorry about this. So we're looking at uh, the life of Joseph. And uh, I hope it's a blessing to you. Okay, God bless. get out of this uh, cul-de-sac so God meant it for good the Bible talks about that God is over nations he's over our enemies he's over everything he's in control of everything that's something we need to hold on to we might have bad things happen to us, difficult things happen to us. But we need to remember that God is sovereign, God is in control. You know, Job went through a difficult time. Job went through a tough time. And um, yet in the midst of all that Job went through, losing his family, losing his kids, losing everything, there was a plan, you know, and maybe you've had a dream you know Joseph had a dream but that dream was shattered for whatever reason which we'll go into but his dream was shattered and maybe you had a dream and that dream's been shattered but in Romans 8 it says for we know all things work together for good to them that love God for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. There's a promise there that all things, not some things, but all things, even the tragedy, even the pain, even the disappointments, even the setbacks, all things work together for good to them that love God. That God is over all our setbacks, all our failures, and that he's working things out for our good. So before we even start, this morning we need to be encouraged that it doesn't matter what's happened to you that all things work together for good to them that love God that if you continue to trust him he 
will be faithful to you and he's there with you in the midst of the challenges that you face. Uh, Chad Williams, who was uh, in the SEAL, Navy SEALs, who's now a preacher, an evangelist, and an apologist, describes as a young boy in his teens, he wanted to be in the Navy SEALs. And his father didn't want him to go in the Navy SEALs, so he got in contact with a, a Navy SEAL and said, will you train my boy, but will you uh, make it difficult? So he packs it in. So this Navy SEAL said, yeah, okay. And he, he got all to Chad, this young boy, took him for a run, beat him up. But Chad wouldn't give up. And Chad, uh, Chad kept going and the Navy SEAL told his dad, you know, I think your son's got what it makes. Well, this Navy SEAL trained Chad every week. He took him on runs every week he trained him. But this Navy SEAL was an expert. It, it won it won medals in uh, various gymnastics. He was a brilliant Navy SEAL. One day, this Navy SEAL went on a a work detour in Iraq, and uh, Chad saw it on the news that his trainer had been killed. People had surrounded the car, and they killed this Navy SEAL who trained Chad and they hung him up on a bridge now Chad was just about to go into the Navy SEALs himself and become a, a Navy SEAL operative soldier he could have just given up and said I'm not doing it anymore I'm not I'm not I'm not gonna go and risk my life like my friend look at the mess he's had but Chad went into the Navy SEALs he didn't give up. Bad things are going to happen sometimes in our lives. Difficult things happen in our lives. It just does. But that doesn't mean that we give up. You know? We don't give up. One of the mottos of the Navy SEALs is when they're in difficulty and they're in a tough time when they're in a tough time and they're in a battle and they just feel like giving up one of the mottos is is think of those who've gone before and just think of those who've gone before Joseph went before you Joseph went through t tr tremendous time he was rejected he was in prison he was he, he, he had so many difficulties to deal with yet he still continued to be faithful Think of those who've gone before, Adonai Judson, he was hung, hung upside down in Burma for being a missionary. Think of those who've gone before, Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, rejected by all those young ministers that he trained in his college. They rejected him and became liberal and followed the liberal downgrade in the Baptist Union. Think of those who've gone before, like Gresham Machen, he was kicked out of the Presbyterian Church because he stood against liberalism. Think of those who've gone before. Those who discipled you, those who stood with you, those who encouraged you. <coughs> so don't quit. It's not a time to quit. Think of those who've gone before. <coughs> so my first point now, Shattered dreams and a dysfunctional family. Do you remember that song, Meet the Flintstones? Yabba dabba doo da, yabba doo da. You know, bit of a dysfunctional family, wasn't it? The Flintstone family, that cartoon family. Well, Joseph's family was dysfunctional. His father, Jacob, had four wives who were always bickering with each other. His brothers got jealous of him. Joseph was proud of the dream that he had and said that you've, I've had a dream and you've all got to bow before me. He couldn't handle his dream, you see. God gave him a dream, but he couldn't handle it. And God maybe have given you a dream, a vision, something that you've had in your heart that you wanted to do. And 
and it shattered, but you weren't ready for it. And Joseph wasn't ready for it, but God in his goodness gave him that dream. And he boasted to his brothers, and it was a dysfunctional family. The brothers, it said, I think it's in Genesis 37, says that they hated him. And when they saw him coming with news, they, they conspired to kill him. But Reuben stuck up for him, had him thrown in a pit, and they were glad to get rid of him, and then they sold him. Uh, it was a dysfunctional family. And Joseph in that dysfunctional family, when he was... When he had his whole family ripped away from him and all his dream shattered, he could have been bitter in that. He could have been angry, but he just kept trusting. He didn't let the dysfunctional family define him. Maybe your marriage is broken up. Maybe your family is not what it should be. Maybe a relationship's broken up. I don't know. Maybe something's happened in your life where you were abused or whatever. You come from a dysfunctional family. You can't let that define you. Even that God can work through. Even that God can work good things out. God was working in, in the dysfunctional family of Joseph. And God is working in your dysfunctional family. And in your life at this time. God meant it for good. And, 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 and you might get down. You might get discouraged because of the dysfunctionalness that you've experienced, whether it be in your marriage, in a relationship, in, in, in your children, in whatever it is. You might get down and you might get discouraged, but God can turn it all around and God is working in it. But most importantly, He's working in you as well. And you mustn't let the dysfunctional family that you've come from or that you've experienced define you. It says in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, you might have made mistakes. But it's time to forgive yourself. To let it go and just come under the blessings of Christ and forgiveness and it's hard to forgive yourself maybe you maybe maybe you're grieving because of your mum or your dad you're grieving because of what's happened to you you're grieving because of whatever things have not turned out the way it has but God's working in it and God's working in you and it'll turn out for the best in the end. All things work together for good to them that love God. God meant it for good. So don't let your dysfunctional family define you. Maintain a walk with God. Maintain following Him. Don't let bitterness define you. Forgive. Forgive those who've hurt you. And let it go. Secondly, if I can remember the point, shattered dreams and false accusation. In the Birmingham pub, pub bombings, they arrested some guys and they put them in prison. Those guys were in prison for many years, but it was a false accusation. They, they'd done nothing wrong, and yet they were thrown in prison had devastating consequences. False accusations have devastating consequences. Have you experienced that? Has someone falsely accused you? Has someone falsely accused you? No one will know the pain that you've experienced under that false accusation. The pain that you've experienced has been unbearable. Imagine the pain that Joseph felt. There he is, he's sold into slavery, but then he's sold uh, into Potiphar's house, and he's working with Potiphar, and he, he's he's there with Potiphar, and he's, he's uh, helping this bodyguard of the Pharaoh, 
uh, looking after his household, but the but but the uh, Potiphar's wife is uh, a seductress, and she fancies him, and she wants him, and she wants to sleep with him. And um, every day it says, every day she's coming up to him, come on, sleep with me, lie with me, and he wouldn't have it. But then she got angry, she was scorned, there's nothing like a woman scorned. She was angry with him and uh, she accused him of wanting to lie with him. Potiphar, as a bodyguard, in those days, uh, you'd have just been killed, but he, he knew that deep down Joseph was innocent, so he just put him in prison. But, he, but Joseph was accused. He was accused, falsely accused. He could have been in prison and said, and been bitter and thought, I'm giving up, I've had enough. Chad Williams talks about critics. He said, critics aren't worth anything. Critics aren't worth anything. He said, there you are in the mist with the blood and guts on you. You're there and you're trying to do your best in the midst of the battle and then a critic comes along and they criticize you, but they're not in the battle. And your critics and those accusers who've accused you, they weren't there at the time. They are not in the heat of the battle and they're not taking the burden of the day. So why have you listened to them? Why have you let that false accusation crush you, that false accusation break you. Your critics are not there with you in the midst of the battle, in the heat of the day. So why listen to them? Jesus didn't listen to his critics, he just got on with it. The Apostle Paul didn't listen to his critics, he just got on with it. And you need to stop listening to your critics and get on with it and stop it. Allowing this false accusation that's come against you to crush you. It's under the blood anyway. If you have made a mistake or whatever, it's under the blood. But Joseph didn't let the accusation crush him and you shouldn't too. Shattered dreams and false accusation. Shattered dreams and in the pit of life. So Joseph is accused of sleeping with Potiphar's wife and now he's in prison. But it said that in when he's in prison, it said the Lord was with him and he, he prospered and the head of the prison made Joseph the next head. And so God was just with him even in the pit, and even in the prison. and. You might feel life is passing you by. You might feel that life is hard and difficult. And, and, and you just say, Jay, well, you know what? You don't, you don't have my life. You don't know what I'm going through. It's difficult. I wish I was out of this situation. It's really, really hard. I'm in, a, I'm in a rock between a hard place here. It's really tough. I'm squeezed on all sides and I'm, I'm finding it really, really difficult. But guess what? Joseph was in prison and guess what? God was with him in the prison. And guess what? God is with you in the prison. God is with you in the situation that you feel is dark and it's difficult for you. God is right there with you. I love that uh, hymn, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It says in... Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 Never will I leave you or forsake you Just going to have to focus a bit more Because I'm in the centre of Manchester now And it's quite busy The Lord's right there with you in the midst of it He's right there in the midst of your challenge He's right there with you my friend You might not be able to see it but it says in the Proverbs, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Just trust him. You might not see the way, but he's with you in it. He's right there with you in it. It says, My God shall supply all your need. He's right there with you, my friend. So you might feel it's difficult, you might feel it's hard. But it was hard for Joseph, he was in prison, but God was with him. 
and in the most difficult places. You might be on a hospital bed right now. You might be enduring cancer right now. You might be going through a really horrendous, difficult time. But you need to know that the Lord's right there with you. He's not abandoned you. You might not feel him. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> they see you uh, indicating and then they take the time. <laughs> He's right there with you in the midst of it. Right there in the midst of it with you. He's there with you in the pit. He's there where, where you feel abandoned, where you feel on your own, where you feel left behind, where you feel... Ah, oh dear, some people. He saw me come in there, this guy. Just concentrate a minute, it's just a bit, a bit busy. Right in the centre of, of Manchester, so there's cars flying everywhere. Even though it's a Sunday. So he, he's there with you in the midst of it, in the midst of your problems. Shattered dreams, next point, shattered dreams and the abandonment of a friend. When Joseph was in prison, there was a cupbearer and a baker who had dreams and Joseph interpreted the dreams. He said the baker was going to get killed, hanged or killed by Pharaoh, but the cupbearer was going to be promoted and be okay. So Joseph said to the cupbearer, you know, remember me when you get promoted. So the cupbearer, you know, said, yeah. Anyway, he gets promoted, the cupbearer, the baker gets killed, but forgets Joseph. Just forgets him. There he is, he's made a friend, he's been friendly to this guy, and this guy's just forgotten him. And uh, sometimes in life, uh, those who are closest to us, our friends, can abandon us, and we can feel abandoned. Think of our Lord Jesus Christ there. He had a friend in... Judas and Judas abandoned him. Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver. One of the hardest things to deal with in life is someone who is close to us, who was close to them, and they betray us. That might be a wife or a husband, it might be someone in a relationship, it might be someone who is in the family or some friend. But they've, they've abandoned us. But even then, Joseph was left in prison for a couple of more years because of that cupbearer forgetting him. And Joseph doesn't get bitter, he doesn't get bitter and twisted, he doesn't get angry. Uh, it talks about uh, an elder mustn't quarrel, mustn't get angry. Uh, in Timothy, 1 Timothy I think it is. And um, Joseph doesn't get angry, doesn't get bitter. When people let us down, we need to focus on Christ. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That our strength is not in relationships, but our strength is in Christ, our strength is in Him. And when we've been hurt by others, we need to just focus on God and the faithfulness of God. Like I said in Hebrews chapter 13, it says, 
Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And even in the midst of your friend's betrayal, God is working. God is working his purposes out in your life. This is not above the power of God. God is at work in that situation. You might not see it and it might hurt, but he is. All things work together for good to them that love God. Even in the abandonment of a friend. Friendships are a gift of God. If God gives you a friendship, it's from God. That friendship goes, you know, God gives and God takes away. And if friends go, they go. If they come, they come. But God gives friendships. We just have to thank the Lord for what he's given us. And if they go, they go. And we just thank the Lord. Joseph was abandoned by that cupbearer. For two more years he languished in jail. Or for a few years he languished in jail. But yet God was still with him. It doesn't matter what people think about you. It doesn't matter if they've abandoned you. It doesn't matter if they've ignored you. It doesn't matter if they don't rate you or don't think you're important. It doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, what matters is what God thinks of you. And God is there with you. And God thinks highly of you. For you are his son or you, and you are his daughter. You are a child of the living God. And God is with you. And God stands with you right now. So it doesn't matter what people think of you. It doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter whether people rate you highly or they don't rate you highly. It doesn't matter with Joseph. He wasn't rated highly by that cupbearer. He was just ignored and forgotten. But yet God was still with him. And God is still with you. God is still with you. He's not forsaken you. He's not abandoned you. He's not taken on board what other people have thought about you. And you need to tell yourself that. You need to tell yourself, you know what? I'm not bothered what people think about me. I'm bothered what the Lord thinks about me. The Lord loves me. The Lord is with me. The Lord forgives me. The Lord strengthens me. The Lord helps me. The Lord guides me. The Lord loves me. The Lord blesses me. And the Lord will fill me. It hurts when a friend abandons you, but the Lord is there with you. And the Lord went through it, and it talks about he is a high priest who is faithful, who, who knows our infirmities. I think it's in Philippians, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. It's in round about there, and it talks about the high priest. Jesus is a high priest who, who knows our infirmities. He knows our loneliness, and he knows the difficulty of an abandoned friend because he went through it himself and he will comfort you it says in uh, one uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 I think verse 3 that God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in our trouble so that we can comfort others so that we will have compassion on other people who feel abandoned we can say well we felt that and then finally Shattered dreams become restored dreams. So, the cupbearer, the, the, the pharaoh has a dream about cows and stuff and nobody can interpret it and the cupbearer says, I know a guy and pharaoh goes and gets Joseph. Joseph interprets the dream, says that there's a famine coming, we need to, uh, seven years of plenty we need to restore that grain for the seven years of famine Pharaoh's like blown away with a guy thinks whoa this guy's amazing oh here we go look at this guy on the wrong side of the road so Joseph um, Joseph um, Joseph gets this top job. 
he's now the top man next to Pharaoh, he's now the Prime Minister, he's now like, he's just like been restored from the pit to the palace as some sermons have said. He's been restored in a miraculous way, he's, he's now the top man, he's now, that dream that he had that people would bow before him, that dream has come true. In all his fullness and glory it's come true. But it wasn't just for the blessings of Joseph, it was the blessings of God's people. Because Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, that it would bless it, that it would bless his people. And God's going to restore your dream, the dream that you had, but it's not just for you, it's for the blessing of his people. So don't give up on your dream, because God will bless that dream, that vision that you've had might have been a vision to be a missionary and for some reason you've not been able to go and do missionary work it might be you had a dream to get married but some reason it's not worked out that way it might it might be a reason to start a business you had a, a vision to start a business and you've not been able to do it, it might be a, a vision to start a ministry and you've not been able to do it you, you, you had a dream and you know that God gave you that dream you know in your heart and of hearts that's the dream you can't give up on that dream. The Navy SEALs have a motto that if you've got a desire, then don't give up on your desire. And a Navy SEAL has an, un uh, 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 an unquenchable desire to succeed. And they don't allow that desire to just give up and dilapidate, to keep going. God has given you a desire, a desire to be a missionary, a desire to be a pastor, a desire to be a preacher, a desire to get married, a desire to, to bring up your children, a desire to, to teach, a desire, whatever it is, a desire to start a business and it's burned in you, it never goes away, but yet you've seen disappointment and disappointment and you felt like giving up. Well, you can't give up on that dream. God gave you that dream and it will be fulfilled in your life. It was fulfilled in Joseph's life. And it was abundantly blessed. And your dream will be abundantly blessed. It will ripen. And when it ripens and when it bears fruit, it, it will be a blessing to other people. You mustn't live as if your dream is crushed. You mustn't live as if your dream is dead. Your dream is not dead. Your dream is not crushed. Your dream is about to come alive. Your dream is about to live. Your dream is about to flourish, my friend. God did not put you on this planet. God did not put you in this situation just to shatter your dream and leave you on the, on the scrap heap of life and say, hey, hey. He's finished now. She's finished now. The dream is dead. Her heart is broken. His heart is broken. Hey, hey, look at him. God didn't want that for you. God doesn't want that for you. God wants you to see your dream come true. Your dream to flourish. Because he put that desire within you. that desire within you that desire to be a Sunday school teacher that desire to be a youth worker that desire to be a preacher that desire to be a husband that desire to be a grandfather or a grandmother that desire to be a businessman or a businesswoman he put that desire within you and you've had setback you've had you've had dysfunctional family setback you've had false accusations setback you've been in the pit in the miry pit set back. You've been forgotten by a friend set back. But God put a desire within your heart. And that desire will be fulfilled, my friend. God put a desire within Joseph's heart. He gave him a dream. And that dream was shattered, but God was working throughout all the mess and all the difficulty. He was working his purposes out. 
We can't understand the storm. We can't understand the darkness. We can't understand the setback. We can't understand sometimes why we have to go through things. But God is purging us and working in us and preparing in us so that dream would become reality. So that dream would be a reality. So don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on your dream. I say don't give up on your dream. Your heart might have been broken. You might have been crushed to the very core of your being. You might feel there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Joseph could have felt like that. There he is in the pit when his brothers threw him in the pit and then shock of horrors he sold into slavery. He could have given up. He could have just, the light could have just gone out and, and that's it. I'm finished. I'm gone. But no, what kept him alive? God, the greatness of God, the greatness of his God, the majesty of his God, the, 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 his God was, he believed in his God. And that false accusation, that disgusting accusation that he slept with Potiphar's wife, he could have just said, that's it, I've had enough. I've had enough. You gave me a dream, but this is just beyond a joke, God. You're just having a laugh with me. You're just mocking me. He could have just given up then. The light could have just gone out, but no. He believed in his God, you see. He believed in those words in Romans. All things work together for good to them that love God. He believed those words. He believed God. He, obviously, he didn't know the book of Romans, but he knew that God was good. He knew that God was sovereign. He'd say, he, 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 you know, he knew it. And he held on to it. He could have just given up when he was in that prison. Day after day, and the mocking mess of it, and the, the sheer routine of people being chained. And yeah, he was a bit of a manager there but it was no life he could have just thought I've had enough I just can't take it anymore and then on top of that when there was just that little bit of ray of hope that just little bit of ray of hope and that's sometimes when it is it really hits you you just think that that little ray that just little bit of hope it's just there it's just about to be I'm, I'm just about to get there and, and then it was snatched from him up there, I forgot him, and he was just left in that prison. Joseph could have just said, ah, you I, 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 I just every time I seem to be going forward, I had to take three steps back, I've had enough, I can't, I can't deal with it anymore. I can't cope with it anymore. Just leave me, God, I'm just out of here. I'm finished. I'm just finished. He didn't do that. Still kept believing, still kept trusting. Killers, you know, he just kept trusting. And God was with him. And God's with, we, with you. Don't abandon your dream. Now in the Navy SEALs, they never quit. They never ever quit, and um, you mustn't quit. It says in Joshua chapter one, it says, "Be strong. Be strong in the Lord." And you need to be strong, and you need to not quit. You need to keep alive your dream. You need to believe your dream will come true. You need to realize that everything that's happened to your life. Even in that, God's been training you. You know that Joseph in the midst of that mess was being trained by God. He was a manager, a little manager, managing Potiphar's house. So he did that little bit of management there. And then he did a little bit of management when he was uh, in prison. He became a manager of the prison. So he's learning how to manage. And now he becomes the top man in, the, in, in Egypt, becomes the prime minister, the top man next to Pharaoh. And... The training that he had in the prison and the training that he had um, at Potiphar's house was the training that prepared him for the greater work. So even in the midst 
of all the difficulties that you've been through, there's been training in that going on that you, you're, you've not been aware of, and that training's been preparing you for the dream that you've had. Your shattered dream, your brokenness, there's been training within that so that you are prepared for the big dream that comes true and you've got the training and preparation for it. So you might have been a, a desiring to be a youth worker and you, 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 you're broken hearted that you couldn't be a youth worker for whatever reason, but you've had kids <laughs> and you've got these kids that you've been bringing up. <laughs> Those kids are part of your preparation, part of the training so that you can be a youth worker. Do you get it? You don't realize it, but God's providing things in your life, preparing you even the midst of difficulties. But you don't quit. You mustn't quit. Joseph didn't quit, so you mustn't quit. And it'll work out in the end. God will work it out. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. God is with you right now. God is working his purposes out in your life. And it'll all work out. Just put every issue, every trouble, every problem, every need, every challenge in his hands. Be faithful within the situation. Don't give up. Don't go back to the world. Joseph could have gone back into sin, but he didn't. He kept faithful. Sometimes when things go wrong, we think, oh, I've had enough, and we go into sin. We justify sin. We say, right, God's not with me. But don't do that. Confess and trust and believe and just hold on in there. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. But God is with you in it, and he's helping you, and he's preparing you. And in the end, you're going to come out at the other end and you're going to find that your dream that was broken is going to be renewed and restored and it's going to be better than ever. All right? So be encouraged. Keep faith. Keep trusting. Keep looking to him. And God is with you. All right, let's close in prayer. So, shattered dream and the dysfunctional family. Shattered dream and the false accusation. Shattered dream and in the pit. Shattered dream and the betrayal of a friend. And shattered dream becomes a restored dream. All right? Those are my points. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today and we need you, Lord. And Lord, sometimes it's tough, sometimes it's hard, but Lord, you're with us. And uh, in the midst of all the challenges that each of us face today, Father God, if we feel like giving up, you are with us and you will comfort us and you will strengthen us and you will restore our dreams. And I pray those who are listening to this video today that their dreams that have been shattered would be restored, that they would have it poured back and renewed. And I pray that, Father, you would just comfort them and, and strengthen them and bless them and just may they know that God is with them. Comfort them, Father, and bless them in Jesus' name for your glory, Lord. God meant it for good. They meant it for ill. But you turned it around for your glory, Lord. And so, Lord, we praise you and thank you that you will make all things better for each of us, Lord, that you will make all things go forward for us. And so we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And I um, hope that was a blessing. I'm now here at church. Can't see the church building. It's uh, across the road, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know how long uh, got on the video here, but... Uh, I think uh, it's a few minutes before the service, so... Um, yeah, so there's nothing else... Uh, we, we was out yesterday preaching. Uh, I had a, a minister and uh, four or five of his guys come out and help, and then two of the old stalwarts came out and helped, so that was good. Uh, the beginning of the yesterday, it was quite, quite difficult. There was rain, uh, so it was raining, and uh, so I had to bear the weather for a bit. We can't go under the food court to protect ourselves from the weather, but... Um, I'm mainly up at another side of Manchester and uh, I like there so I, I, I just weathered the rain for a couple of hours and then it, it came and it was beautifully sunny later on. 
uh, but it was a bit difficult uh, standing in the rain and trying to preach. Um, but we've had some encouragements. I mean, when we were in War when I was in Warrington the other day, there was a little girl about seven, and she c she was with her parents, and she came up to one of us and asked how she could be saved. And uh, one of them, one of our guy, one of the guys, um, led the little girl to the Lord. So, so that was a tremendous encouragement. Um. And it seems to be that every time I go places, I meet Christians, you know. I was in Rochdale and I met some Christians there, and they we, we, we helped each other. And I was in uh, Warrington the other day, and there were Christians there, and we helped each other. So God's good, you know. God kind of brings people to help, and some really, really good people as well. So, so yeah, the, the mic, um, I've got a speaker, and... Uh, which I'll, I'll make a video about, but uh, we've had people pull the mic, and and uh, that's been really difficult because the mic uh, the mic's now broke. I think it keeps going out. It's not just the mic itself, but it's the uh, speaker as well. So I need to pray about getting another speaker soon. So so these are trials and tribulations of street preaching. Um, yeah, so. Um, I've not looked at my Patreon account yet. Uh, we'll do uh, um, tomorrow, and if there's been any donations, I'll, I'll give a thank you video for that. So if anybody has, I want to thank you in advance for your encouragement and your support, and it's really appreciated. So uh, thank you, and I'll make a video anyway on Monday uh, to thank anybody who's donated or or supported me in any way so um, nothing else to report really um, yeah just uh, just be, I just really enjoyed studying last night uh, some resources on Joseph um, you can uh, there's a sermon by Sinclair Ferguson called all things for good it's a really moving uh, encouraging sermon on the life of Joseph. An excellent overview of Joseph is by John MacArthur, an excellent sermon by John MacArthur, an overview of Joseph. I recommend that if you want to get a, an overview of the book. Um, and I think it's under all, if you type in, in YouTube, All Things For Good, uh, you, you should find it or, or just type in Joseph and John MacArthur. Um, there is a series which I didn't get a chance to look at by John Lennox on Joseph. There's about five sermons, but I didn't get a chance to look at it fully. And then a couple of uh, books that you can listen to. Uh, sorry, uh, books that you can read. Um, there is a little pamphlet called Behind a Frown in Providence by J. Murray. And that... Um, can be found at the Banner Truth. It's a booklet, uh, and it seems really good. So uh, have a look at that. Behind a Friend in Providence by J. Murray uh, at the Banner Truth. It's a booklet. Get hold of that booklet. I'm sure it'll be a blessing to you. I read it years ago. So, um, and then there's um, John Flavel. I think Flavel on the Providence. Um, have a look at that that's a book on providence by a Puritan writer um, yeah so those are some resources a booklet a book and a couple of sermons <coughs> so there's nothing else to. I've just got a few minutes before I go to church there's nothing else uh, to talk about really um Yeah, I I was in Warrington the other day, and I, I got talking to a uh, to a Mormon, and uh, I just thought it was interesting talking to the Mormon because they were using the same they were they were kind of using the same argument 
as the Muslims. Um, there was it, this Mormon was saying that um, that the Bible was not perfect, that it had changed, and uh, that the Book of Mormon is perfect. So I asked a few questions. I said, I know. I said, I said let, let me get this straight. You're saying that in the Old Testament, there's a prophecy that the Book of Mormon's in there. You talk about two sticks, and you're saying that the Book of Mormon is the two sticks. I said, yeah. And then you're saying the Bible's changed. I said, it, it seems contradictory. You're saying that it confirms us. The Bible confirms us, but it's corrupt. I said, that's just double standards. I said, you know, can God be defeated? If he gives his word, it, it, it can't change. And he said, yeah, but the fact is it, the, the Bible was chosen at the Council of Nicaea and it has changed. So I had to tell him about textual criticism and the manuscripts and etc. Um, but I asked him, I said, well, these plates that you said, where's the historical evidence about the writer of these plates because he said somebody wrote these Mornai or somebody wrote these plates I said what is the historical evidence for the person writing these books and uh, he um, he didn't want to know then when I asked that question he said there were eight people who witnessed the, of these plates that Joseph Smith had, had these plates and I was just thinking to myself I didn't want to tell him because I didn't want to offend him, but I was going to say to him, you know, Joseph Smith sent his missionaries, men missionaries abroad, and then told them that he was going to marry their wives and sleep with their wives. So, I mean, he was a false prophet. But I didn't mention that, but I did mention that... Um, I, I did say, well, you said there were these eight witnesses to Joseph Smith. Some of them, at least one of them, but some of them recanted. I said, we don't see anybody recanting uh, who said they saw Jesus rise rise from the dead. They didn't recant, but they did. some of them did recant who said they saw these plates uh, by Joseph Smith. I said, I can't give you the detail exact reference, but it's something that you could check out. But once I started asking questions, I said, well, what about this tribe that went from Jerusalem over to the South Americas? Do we have any hist any?" historical evidence, inscriptions or anything, that this happened. And he said, you know, I just don't want to know, you know. He said, I, I think it's not getting anywhere, this. So whenever you kind of challenge them and question them, they don't want to know. But I did make the point that they say, you know, let God testify to you that it's true in your heart. And I said, that's true. The, the highest testimony is God, but God's not anti-intellectual and it's not blind faith. And that God um, gives us evidence for our faith. And I said, there's no evidence for this tribe going from Jerusalem over to the Americas. There's no evidence of uh, this guy writing these plates, so you're saying, this ancient guy. Um, there's no evidence of that. I said, but there's evidence, eyewitness evidence, that Jesus died and rose again. And... Um, yeah, so he, he didn't want to know. And, and that's what you find with missionaries, uh, Muslim missionaries or Mormon missionaries. When you corner them and begin to ask them questions, they don't want to know. But they're, they're quick to challenge you, they're quick to question you. But when you start to question them and you start to ask them questions, they, um, they don't really want to know. But what I found interesting, what really, really interested me, what really interested me, interested me, what was of real interest, was this issue of authority. Because he used the same argument that the Muslims use. He said that the, the Bible's not perfect. And he was saying, you know, this plate, these plates were perfect and they've not been changed. And this, what the, Mor the Muslims say, the same, you know, Muhammad got a, a text that got a Quran from um, from uh, Allah through Gabriel and it's not changed but the Bible's changed and so what the Mo what the Mormons and the Muslims have do done they set up this false authority 
in this static unedited text and then we have our thousands of manuscripts so they say yours is edited yours is yours is multiple edited and ours isn't ours is this pure one text but in a way there's actually a stronger argument on our side and that's this and I made this point to the Mormon and, and he didn't want to come back at it, he didn't didn't respond to it. I said, but I said it actually proves that the Bible is the word of God because for every copy, ancient copy of the Bible, that's a witness to its truth. You see, no you, you, because you've got this so called one copy, this one plate, which, which is nonsense anyway. There's no other testimony of any, any other text to prove that the text that you have has not changed. But because we have so many texts, each one of those texts of that thousand, five thousand, is a witness to the truth of the original text. So you've got no witnesses to back up your claim that that text is the original text. But because we have so many thousands of manuscripts, we have thousands of witnesses that this is the original, that we have the original text. So not, so the devil seems to want to use the Muslims and the Mormons to say, well, you've, we've got this one static text that's not changed and it's not been edited, it's not been copied and changed. It's absolutely static. It's one text and uh, we have the plates or we have... Uthman's recension says the Muslims, we have the place of the Mormons, we have these one text. And they think that trumps us because it hasn't changed. But the reality is, it, it shows how intellectually vacuous and implored on itself because there's no witnesses to it. Whereas we have thousands of witnesses to our manuscripts, uh, to our original manuscript, th those thousands of manuscripts bear witness that there was an original manuscript. Um, so those are my thoughts anyway. So Okay, it's church in a second, so I'm going to go. Hope the sermon's been a blessing. Hope my apologetic quandary, uh, uh, pontifications have been a blessing to you. And uh, thanks for all your encouragement. Thanks for your blessing. God is good. And uh, I'm going to be off to church in a minute. So... Uh, I don't know if I can get this, but...